All right, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are talking about the state of over-the-top video and TV everywhere rollouts. We've got an excellent panel of uh, some very knowledgeable uh, industry insiders. So let's get going. Uh, I'm Bill Niemeyer. I'm a senior analyst with TDG Research. Uh, we do both uh, qualitative uh, analysis and reports, uh, forecasts about the market, but then we also do consumer research where we query consumers about uh, what, uh, what they're doing, what they're thinking, and uh, what they think they're going to be doing in the future. So uh, let's uh, first of all have the panel introduce themselves. Let's just go uh, down the panel uh, this way and uh, they'll introduce themselves and then uh, we'll get going. Hi, my name is Kurt Hoppe with LG Electronics. I head up a, uh, an innovation team based out of our uh, Silicon Valley lab and our team does really two things. We uh, look for new features and uh, services that span our, devi our connected devices like TVs or Blu-ray players, tablets, uh, even appliances. And then the second thing we do is we take those platforms and technologies out to uh, non-traditional uh, channels. So LG traditionally sells our products through retail, Best Buy, Amazon. Uh, but if we have a connected, a whole bunch of connected devices in the home, what else can that do and who else can that help? So it ends us, uh, you know, puts us in the door of companies like Verizon where we say, why do you need a physical set-top box for that nice four millimeter thick OLED TV hanging on your wall? Let's just put it in the smart TV. So that's, that's what my team does. Hi, uh, uh, Hot Mike. I'm Campbell Foster. I'm Director of Product Marketing for Adobe Primetime. Uh, Adobe Primetime is a modular solution that stitches together a number of different Adobe technologies, including content prep and packaging, DRM, all the player technologies, uh, ad insertion, uh, ad decisioning or ad serving, as well as real-time dashboards or quality of experience metrics and analytics. So if you want to hear about any of those things, I'd love to talk to you. Hi, I'm David Schlock from DirecTV, Senior Director for Multimedia. I have a couple of roles, one of them similar to Kurt, where I lead an innovation group in DirecTV that's spending a lot of time visiting customers, looking for pain points, and solving specific problems all across our offering as part of our engineering group. Also lead the team that's involved in business development, engineering, interface into the business development team for technology partnerships. And the last little pitch for tomorrow, I'm part of the OATC, which is a technical committee meeting among all the operators, content owners, and technology companies to standardize some of the interfaces needed to make TV everywhere more work better across all these different platforms. Thanks. Uh, my name is Brian Jaquit. I'm from Sling Media. I head up marketing and communications. Uh, Sling Media has been around for a number of years, um, making a retail product called the Sling Box that we sell through you know, brick and mortars like Best Buy and also online like Amazon. But more recently, uh, integrating the technology, one of the things we're working on very, very hard is integrating the technology at the chipset level uh, into set-top boxes for cable and satellite TV operators. The hopper with Sling from Dish Network is an example of that. Um, and also, uh, we have a deal now with a cable manufacturer called Aris, who uh, is also um, looking to integrate the technology into network transcoder and media gateway devices, as well as our own set-top boxes that they sell to uh, the largest and smallest uh, cable operators around the world. So uh, Sling Media uh, is, uh, I work on a number of different things. Um, uh, related to both uh, our retail and OEM sales um, and look forward to talking to you today. Thanks. Thank you. So we're going to talk about uh, the extremely clear and easy to understand field of uh, OTT and TV everywhere, which uh, I mean to say is uh, highly dynamic and somewhat confusing. So I think one of the things I want to do first is get get a level set for the, 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 the field uh, right now in order to, to help set the stage for the discussion we're going to have. And we're going to dive a lot deeper on TVE a little bit later, so I don't necessarily want to go into it too much. But, but let's talk about uh, the, 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 the content services. Uh, we've got, clearly there's Netflix in market. Uh, this is my chance to throw out some numbers. Uh, I did a, a deep dive on Netflix's uh, subscriber and usage trends. Uh, it's probably pretty well known now that they passed HBO uh, in total subscribers. Uh, I, I would pet, put that as a fair comparison, similar price points, uh, similar services, although the content is, is different in terms of uh, its age. But uh, 
and they're, they're getting a lot of usage. It's about, uh, if you look at the total amount of TV viewing in the US, it's around 500 billion person hours a year. Uh, we uh, watch more TV than we have hours worked in the US. And uh, Netflix is, a, is around, gets around 2.5%, or their level is 2.5% versus TV. So still in single digits, but that's still a big number. Uh, so let's talk about the, what I'd call the, the, the online natives. There's Netflix, but then there's, there's others out there. There's Hulu, but then you start having, looking hard to find others that are getting any significant amount of usage. And I'm not including YouTube in this. I think we're talking about premium TV and movie content. Uh, certainly there are others that are creating buzz, but, but what does the online native landscape look right, like right now for OTT? I think it certainly looks confusing for consumers. There's all these different services. How do I get this content? Why is it integrated into my set-top box experience? Why do I have to log into this thing? Why is this such a pain in the ass? So I think if you look at it from, the viewer, from a consumer's perspective, from your mom's perspective, it's a really confusing landscape. I also think it's very fragmented. I mean, I think that, that with all of Netflix's success, uh, how many times other than when your kids, you know, go to use it, which obviously they get bored of nothing um, and they can watch something over and over and over again and not get bored. But really, um, if you want really good quality content, whether it be new releases or whether it be back catalog or original programming, um, you know, Netflix is making strides. But I think that also that there's a lot of fragmentation in the market. and. A, a person that's used to cable and satellite, and maybe the young generation is not as used to this, but a person that's used to cable and satellite and to a subscription service knows where that content is, knows what they have access to, knows what they, uh, they can watch, and they expect that experience. And I think that that's what's a real challenge. It's like, okay, so that movie is available on Netflix or it's not. It's Maybe it's available on Amazon for four bucks. Or the series is available on uh, Hulu, but I got to subscribe to that for eight bucks. And then, you know, before you know it, the whole purpose of you trying to use OTT to maybe uh, reduce or, or shave off your cable bill becomes, you know, an added hundred dollars a month for your over-the-top services. So I think that that's a real challenge in the market as well. I think they've set the bar a little bit as far as the user interface, the accessibility to content. If you look three or four years ago, Netflix was all about movies, started with their DVDs, but now most of the people do it because of their own original shows. And of course, our kids are using it because it's another source of kids' content. And we even see it among DirecTV employees using Netflix when they get free DirecTV. They want access to more content. A couple more dollars a month is not a big deal, but if they try to raise their price, you can be sure a lot of people would disconnect. I, I was going to estimate there, there's certainly probably 10 apps or less OTT apps, you know, and OTT being an unmanaged, uh, you know, video stream delivered over IP. Uh, and I guess if you get through audio in, Pandora is used a lot too, which is an OTT service, but not video. But uh, I don't know why we would exclude YouTube. There is certainly a lot of usage. There is in some premium content on there. Um, I was talking to a service provider in Europe recently. Over 50% of their network traffic is, uh, is YouTube. So it's getting a lot of usage, but other, other names we haven't mentioned yet, uh, transactional VOD like uh, Vudu, uh, Amazon, of course, Amazon Instant offers both subscription video on demand like Netflix, but also transactional VOD like, uh, like Vudu. Cinema Now, less of a, uh, you know, some people use Cinema Now, not maybe that many. <laughs> and then uh, the MVPD application th themselves, which I think uh, we'll probably talk about. Well, let's, let's highlight Amazon for a bit. I think Amazon, uh, They've, well, they've certainly improved their content library. Uh, and they're getting quite a lot of buzz for their, their new original content, uh, Alpha House. Uh, there's also a lot of work to be done, including perhaps a UI that's better suited to uh, search and discovery for video. What's going on with them? You know, they certainly have a lot of resources. Why haven't they come with a bigger, better product? Or do we know? Well, they, they, have a, they have a competing product to Apple in the tablet market, so they have a, a difficulty doing transactions on a tablet. So you have to do all the transactions on the PC or the Mac. 
and then the, the or on your, your device, like a Roku, for example, and then the product shows up in your library. If you were doing an a la carte, obviously. The subscription service, um, which is linked to Prime, which is great value, obviously, 84 bucks a month, I think it is, uh, for your two -day, free two-day shipping um, and adds videos, but still uh, that content library is limited. And it goes back to my original point is that you don't know what you have. You know what you have on cable and satellite. You know what you have in terms of your local sports teams. You know what you have in terms of your primetime programming. You know what you have in terms of your local news, your local weather, the content that you're used to from where you live. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. And while you know Amazon is going to you know continue to butt up against Apple, both on the library side of things, they go against iTunes um, with their transactional uh, content. They're also going to butt up against Apple in, in terms of their, their hardware. You know, the, the theory is that they'll have a, a set-top box um, sometime in the new year. The, the other theory is that they'll have a phone. These are all things that basically um, uh, uh, you know, put themselves right into the ecosystem. And I think that when the Kindle Fire first came out, it was an important uh, point that they had hardware as well as, as content all wrapped into one. But um, that also put them squarely in the eyes of a lot of their, comp their competition. Yeah, I think that Amazon has three huge things going for it when it's playing in video. I think the first is that they tend to play the long game. So they look out five to 10 years. They're not looking at in the next couple of quarters. They're saying, in 10 years, here's where we want to be. That's what they did in books. That's what they did in their marketplace. That's what they're doing in SaaS right now. So they really tend to play the long game. That's one. Two, they're very well capitalized. They have very deep pockets. So with these content deals that are extremely expensive, they will pony up. Um, they also have access to lawyers because they have so much um, capital, which you need when you're in the content game. So that's two. And three, which is the biggest asset that Amazon has, is access to user data, information about behavioral patterns based on um, what consumers are doing elsewhere on their site. So if they get their act together and incorporate that user data into the UI with recommendations and personalization, I think it could be a really killer product. Um, I think the, the one big thing that they have, um, the, the, the one big strike against them is that, and this is a, a common criticism of Amazon, is that they're really, they're really stretched thin. It's not clear if they really are committed to doing this. All right. Um, and as I said, we're going to do a deep dive on, on television everywhere in a moment. But let's talk about uh, devices. Uh, as, uh, as you probably know, there's an awful lot of devices out there. And I'm not talking about their numbers. I'm talking about different ones. So uh, from the perspective of your company, what does that device landscape look like? Uh, because every single company that has to create uh, an application or content delivery experience has to make some hard decisions about what do they develop for. And it gets down to specifics in terms of not only a class of device, but operating system. So what, is, what does that landscape look like? So, so as a, I guess as a device manufacturer, we're, uh, again, we're trying to compete on the device itself against our competition. And, and, but we are aware that the TV market, for, for one example, is a highly fragmented market. So, uh, you know, Samsung's number one, LG's number two, there's, you know, Sony and, and lots, of, lots, lots of others. And if you look around the world, there's uh, difficulties if you want to develop an application uh, that works on all those platforms. So um, although we're competing on the div display technology side with 4K and, and LED and OL OLED and things like that, we are trying to have a, a, a platform uh, that's common. Uh, then you know for for the developers and for the content owners. So uh, LG sees ourselves as a services aggregator. So we don't know when someone buys a TV on Amazon or Best Buy if they're going to take it home to use it for, you know, the Amazon app, Netflix, or you know Comcast. Um, so we just try to have put the SDK out there, and then we promote industry uh, initiatives like the Smart TV Alliance uh, with Toshiba, Panasonic, Philips where we try to have a common web SDK so developers or content owners can write that app once and hopefully uh, it, it runs on you know, tens of millions of more devices than just uh, one manufacturer. Uh, from our perspective, I think the, the split today is from around 50% PCs and Macs versus other devices. As far as developers, there's no question that there's more phones out there. There are people are using them, but I think people are using tablets more to watch video for longer amounts of time. A year ago, I would have said it was clear winner for Apple in the iPad area. Today, we see Android coming up. And just today, 
made an announcement about out-of-home streaming, and we'll be launching simultaneously on Android and iOS. So I think uh, Android's catching up in the number. People are still using their iPhones and iPads more for this kind of behavior, but the sheer number of devices is definitely in Android's favor. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add for, from a Sling perspective, uh, whether it be the integrated products that, that Dish customers use or the retail products, the Sling boxes, tablets and especially uh, iOS is a, is a clear uh, dominating force. Um, I think that leads to what our usage is, though, also, which is a lot of sports and, and a lot of prime time. And one of the things that um, I'd love to talk about more is actually the, the revival, and maybe some might say that Twitter has caused this, but the revival of appointment television again, and the fact that you want to watch something live. Either you want to watch something live or you don't want to watch it at all, or you want to watch something live um, because you want to share in that moment. And that's, you know, if you can't watch it on, on your big screen TV, it's going to be on your tablet. It might be on your smartphone, but it's a little bit more of a snacking type of thing. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, the iOS and Android platforms, with Kindle Fire being kind of a subset of that, um, are, are probably the most important for us. So in terms of uh, devices, um, it, this, this fragmentation, it, are there devices that, that come along that might seem attractive, say like you know an Xbox One or a PS4, and because of the overhead that, that uh, people that have to create apps must deal with, they just get put aside for a while? They don't get thrown out, but do they get put aside? I don't know if they get put aside. I know that the, the, the uh, platform that is causing programmers and MVPDs the biggest headaches right now is Android. Um, if there's a platform that programmers, big programmers like Turner, are coming to Adobe and saying, please help us solve this, it's Android. And, and what's the issue? With the, the core issue is that there's 26 different versions of the software out there. Um, and as a, one of the largest programmers in the US, top three programmer, came to us and said, we have to employ five developers to, to push out um, mobile apps for every one developer we hire for uh, desktop. So that kind of support just isn't scalable, and that's just for one mobile platform. You multiply that by three or four, um, it just becomes, uh, that's what's creating all this overhead, is, is the development overhead. Um, but the real pain around platforms now is specifically around Android. All right. Get one second. The gaming consoles are a little bit of a challenge, mainly because they're a closed platform relatively compared to the other devices. And from our perspective, they're competing for the big screen in the living room. Why would we develop something that's going to sit side by side with our box when you can just switch the input of the TV to watch this? Pro I think with Xbox One and PS4, you may see all these new Connect and other interfaces that'll be attractive, but so far, those haven't launched yet or not in any big enough numbers to make a difference. The only thing I would add is that for us, the, an Xbox One, a PS4, you know, whether it be an Apple TV or Roku, uh, we use those platforms to deliver a you know, living room experience on another TV, either in another room, uh, eliminating the cable box, or in a remote location as well. So you could have your San Francisco-based television piped to another TV in, say, Idaho or New York or something like that. And so those devices they require, obviously, um, uh, some work to get them to, to, to stream the, uh, the content to that remote television source. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about TV everywhere. And uh, I'll give my own uh, biased recap of uh, the last uh, five years or so of TV everywhere. So early 2009, you see uh, Jeff Bukas, who uh, I'm not sure at the time we've, if he was CEO of Time Warner or not, but he is now. Uh, and Brian Roberts, CEO of Comcast, uh, beginning to talk uh, quite a lot in public about TV Everywhere, an initiative to bring uh, television access authenticated to authenticated subscribers of multi-channel operators to a wide range of devices, PCs, tablets, smartphones, and other things. And then we had uh, several years of very little action. Uh, if, you, if you take uh, HBO out, which got out in front on, on this, uh, not hardly uh, a lot of action at all. Uh, one of the things uh, I've been doing in March, I did a uh, review of the availability of TV Everywhere. And uh, on a uh, subscriber-weighted basis, the top 14 networks that were under t TVE authentication, uh, their availability to subscribers 
of the top 15 MVPDs, and this is on a subscriber-weighted basis, was 45%, which I took to mean less than half rolled out four years out. Now, uh, I've just completed the same uh, review uh, uh, as of October. Uh, I, I can't reveal the number because it, it hasn't fully passed internal review at TDG, but it's gone up quite a lot. So uh, my question to the panel is the big why. Why, why did it take uh, four years to get halfway rolled out, and why did this summer uh, everybody seem to, uh, I don't know, crawl out of bed with a new attitude and get things done? Yeah, I, I think that um, TV Everywhere, the, the, the executives determined the, what the problem was you know, three, four years ago. They figured out what the problem was and, and said, you guys go figure out how to do this from a technology perspective. And Adobe sat down in a room with Turner and Comcast and whiteboarded this out and said, this is how the technology is going to work. So the technology was actually solved by Adobe. Uh, we won uh, an Emmy Award for this technology uh, called Adobe Pass. It's now a core component of Adobe Primetime. Um, but the, that we didn't solve the business issues. And we can't force Comcast and Turner to sit down in a room and renegotiate their rights agreements. So that's really what's been holding it up. And David, we were talking uh, with DirecTV earlier and said it seems like there was a confluence or a convergence of rights agreements that all came up for renegotiation all at the same time. So that really seems to me to be driving um, TV Everywhere adoption a lot more in the last four in the last four months than it had in the, in the previous four years. So I don't know if you want. To I think when we first launched 2009, the optimists thought it would take two years. The realists and the pessimists were predicting five years for this to widely roll out, both from a rights issue and a technology issue. I think the technology issues of streaming authentication have mostly been solved. The only technology issues really holding things back are our own back-end systems, billing systems. So enable new, uh, new rollouts. The rights issues, we have different contracts expiring every year, and until all those get renewed piece by piece, you know, all, we have a Turner agreement being negotiated now. When that's done, we'll have more Turner networks. When we have, you know, we, NBC was one of the first, so we launched a lot of NBC channels. And as those agreements roll out, you'll see more and more content. I think within the next two or three years, a whole complete round of those agreements will have passed. So you'll see most of the networks that were interested in getting carried, they'll be carried for whatever terms we negotiate. Uh, Sling Media would argue that TV Everywhere was sold seven years ago when the first Slingbox came out. <laughs> That's our own opinion. Uh, I actually think my, my other belief on this also, is also has been the pressure, and, and David's exactly right, there's, there's negotiations with um, carriage agreements and, and all those things that come up on a, on a it almost seems like monthly basis these days. Uh, but there is a lot of pressure from over the top services and Netflix being the number one piece of that. And there's uh, a lot of talk obviously about cord cutting. There's a lot of talk about people moving away from cable and satellite and, and telco. I guess maybe telco is going up, but the other ones um, are losing subscribers or they're, or they're pretty flat growth. And so I think that there is an added pressure to deliver a true four screen, if you will, for lack of a better word, experience. A consumer is, is basically when they sign up for cable or satellite, they demand to be able to watch on the big screen, they demand to be able to watch on their PC or Mac, they demand to be able to watch on their tablet and their smartphone, and they don't ha wanna think about which services they need to sign up for or, or which type of, um, uh, uh, you know, what they have access to and what they don't have access to. And I think that if an operator can provide that, then they're at a competitive advantage. And so some operators are being more aggressive than others, obviously. Um, Dish is, is being very, very aggressive. They've gone so far as to giving you an iPad when you sign up for uh, service and, and, uh, and, and get a hopper with Sling. And basically, within 30 seconds of having it installed, you can log into your account on a tablet, on a smartphone, uh, Android or iOS, and be watching your live TV and also all their over the t um, top on demand content right on your device of choice. So there's, an a, there's a real nice um, uh, integration there, I think, that they're, they're offering. And I think that that's, you're going to see more of that, obviously, um, because the consumer is going to go somewhere else if they, they can find the experience better on another operator. And then just, uh, just one last thing to add. I think there's some encouragement by the government to, uh, to unlock some of the content that's uh, in the set-top box world to be available on CE devices, live TV specifically. So the F <coughs> FCC set some deadlines for next summer, which uh, at least the cable guys are aware of. 
So I think in addition to what Dish and DirecTV are doing with their, with their multi-room solutions, uh, you know, the cable guys have, they're working on a, a technology solution to uh, offer that same kind of moving content from a, a video gateway in the house to these other CE devices. And those ones don't require a renegotiating of any agreements because it's just moving it around securely inside the house, something that was approved, uh, you know, five or six years ago. Do you think that the MVPD shareholders really drove some of this change? I mean, if I'm a big Comcast shareholder, and you're losing subscribers, I would say, guys, part of the problem is consumers don't know about these TV Everywhere services. If they can get it with their Comcast password, why don't you tell them what their password is? Do a mailer or something? Like, if you are really losing subscribers, you need to drive awareness of and adoption of TV Everywhere among your consumer base, among your subscriber base. So I, I do think, that, so I'm answering my own question. I think that this is largely driven by MVPD is losing subscribers. They, shareholders are saying, you, you, you stop the bleeding here. Um, get your act together. The good news is everybody except cable has gained subscribers, at least in the last quarter. <laughs> Unexpect, unexpectedly, I might add. <laughs> but the, even the total universe, the number of pay TV customers drops less than last year. So cord cutting is not as big a threat as possible. But I agree that, especially in the home, there's no reason you should have to log on with a password to get to your TV services. If you can do it on your set-top box, you should be able to do the same thing. And Adobe and others are working on solutions. You'll hear more about that tomorrow. If you join Panel 8 202, we're talking about some of these solutions that are in development across the industry. Now, let's, uh, one thing I want to talk about, which I, I think is a trend that I'm noticing, is uh, live, linear uh, television everywhere. Yeah, I think when television everywhere got going, we we're thinking about it more as an on-demand uh, sort of experience. Next day of uh, viewing of full episodes online. Um, but the fact is that Americans love live TV. You know, DVRs, as much as uh, I would suspect uh, most people in this room have one, I do, uh, you know, still have only gotten to 50% of households. Americans like watching live TV. So uh, this is one thing that, uh, in the consumer survey work that we've been doing and that we've been telling the clients, which uh, do include some, some large operators and networks or media companies, is that live linear uh, would raise customer satisfaction both with the, the subscription overall and with uh, a potential TV Everywhere uh, product. Uh, by the way, in terms of ruthless plugs, if you go to tdgresearch.com, you can sign up for our opinion uh, emails. Uh, which will give you, uh, it's uh, the analysts writing opinions about what they see in the news or uh, things, that work that we've done. Um, so it, is there uh, a switch in mindset going towards offering more live linear uh, going on among uh, both networks and operators? Well, I mean, live linear is, I think when you think about it, it's, it's uh, especially in the United States where we're so segmented in terms of from a sports, from a news perspective, you have your national news, you have your national sports, but you also have all your different uh, regional sports teams, regional sports networks. Um, you, so you think about sports when you think of live linear. But I, I will come back to this, and, and, and that's, that's a given, I think, and, and it's what drives our usage through the roof on Saturdays for college football and Sundays for NFL football. Um, and during the week for you know basketball games, baseball games, et cetera. Um, but I will say this, is that uh, to your point about DVRs, I do think that in the age of Twitter, uh, coming back to this, people want to watch live, they want to watch big moments live, big, uh, big shows live because they want to get in on the conversation. When Breaking Bad, was ending its run, run with three episodes or so. You couldn't get that from over the top, right? You could get every episode leading up to the final season, but you couldn't get it from over the top. Um, and if you're not in front of your TV, or even if you are in front of your TV, you're going to have your tablet right there. You're going to be tweeting about it. You're going to be um, you know, getting in on the conversation. And so we saw huge, huge spikes um, from our customers because when they aren't in front of their TV, they don't have access to a TV, the best way you're going to be able to watch live and in real time is through something um, that's powered by Sling, Sling technology and, and maybe other TV everywhere technology. So I think you're going to see more of that um, in the future. 
A quick comment there. I think it really depends on where you are. There's in the home and out of the home. If you're in the home and Sling has a solution, it's easy to stream to all your devices. But I have four Sling boxes at home for all kinds of different reasons. When you're on the road, it's a challenge. I have a, a cable subscription, and you only have one or two megabits upstream. You're going across all these different networks to your hotel, whatever. It just doesn't work. If you live in New York, you're riding the train, or you're flying across the country on a plane, your sling box doesn't help you. You need to download the content ahead of time and take it with you. So there is definitely a bandwidth issue with all those things. I think consumers want access to all their networks and all their devices all the time. And in addition to that, they want the ability to download and take it with them for a road trip, plane trip, or whatever else it is. And that's still coming, but we'll, I think we'll get there within the next two or three years. Yeah, I, I think that the 2012 Summer Olympics were uh, a watershed moment for live linear availability across devices. And I think NBC really took a leadership position in making that content available, um, at least in the US. Outside the US, it was largely the BBC. But um, I, I think that if there's one thing gating or holding back more live linear programming, it's currency and measurement. I mean, until Nielsen is taking account, and, and they are, there's been uh, a report that came out this week, um, obviously with OCR, they're doing a lot with Facebook, and, and Nielsen is doing a lot to help solve these problems. But until the problem is actually solved and a stream on a device is counted the same way it's counted on a television, um, programmers really have little incentive to push as much live linear onto devices as possible. So let's, th this brings up uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask, so thank you, Campbell. Uh, so th th we, let's say we can uh, wave our hands and get 100% uh, uh, deployment of authenticated uh, television content online and quality of service is excellent. But uh, that's not the whole story. As you mentioned, uh, since ad-supported TV is the dominant uh, viewing medium in television, uh, ad support is vital. And the net, yeah. so can, can we go into a bit about the state of advertising in TVE right now and where it needs to go from, uh, I certainly wish we had a, a network person here, but, but, but sort of from the perspective of the people that, that are trying to earn those dollars, uh, for advertising. Uh, what do they need uh, out of uh, the online platforms to make some money? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> full disclosure, I worked, worked at DoubleClick Adobe for five Solutions, years. right? <laughs> so, I'm not gonna, so my background is in, you know, is in the ad technology piece of it. Um, certainly uh, currency, like I said, Nielsen, um, this is, solving that problem is huge. I think that more flexibility from Nielsen for live linear within the C3 and C7 windows to optimize ad loads so that uh, programmers or broadcasters have the flexibility to change the ad load based on um, ad tolerance um, would be big right now if it's within, I think it's both C3 and C7, um, you can't actually change the ad load between the original linear broadcast um, and what's streamed uh, online later. It has to stay the same for measurement purposes. Um, I think that's really limiting. Um, and then things that uh, have been solved in the display world for, the, for five, even 10 years, better targeting, uh, better personalization, all those things, and, and ad load optimization is really a part of that. But, um, and a lot of that, I'm just spewing jargon here, I think it's making that easier for the broadcaster. Ad operations people um, in the, on the digital side of broadcasters have to deal with uh, an enormously complex world, and simplifying the advertising technologies for ad ops is, uh, is, a, big, is a big challenge. I would just add, I, I, I would disagree with Mr. Slack about the quality of streaming outside the home, but that's, uh, that's <laughs> you know, a little, little bit. But um, the, um, the ad stuff uh, reminds me of, of um, what's happened in the airline industry, where there's a little, you know, every single time you, you fly a plane, there's one more thing they want to charge you for. And uh, every time I watch a, a show uh, through, you know, like a free show, uh, whether it be through like an ABC app or something like that, I feel like that there's, you know, every single part that they can throw a pre-roll or, or <laughs> an interstitial hat in there, they'll throw it. And by the end of the, the end of a 60-minute uh, program, I've memorized the, the four ads that have run like 15 times. And so I think they're, they're, they're getting there, but I think also there's a lot more targeting that can be done. And what I would say about Sling is that actually, you know, the difference we have is we deliver whatever it is you have on your home television set. So uh, whether you're in New York or you're in uh, Arkansas, you're getting basically 
your living room television uh, advertising, your local advertising as well, uh, much more targeted and, and, and much more measured as well. So I, I wanted to, to speak a bit about uh, the potential for television everywhere moving viewing over to the internet. And, and I'll throw out uh, another stat of which uh, I have endless supply. This is uh, regarding the distribution of television viewing on, on conventional platforms. So uh, if you look at the total, uh, subscription viewing, uh, which would be HBO, Showtime, Stars, and a few others, is around 5% of that total. Uh, Ad supported viewing is around is 90 plus percent of that total. So now, if if the objective of TV everywhere is to bring not only subscription viewing but all that ad supported viewing over to the internet, moving even a few single digits over uh, can create quite a challenge. Because if you look at YouTube and and Netflix together, uh, Sandvine did its uh, I guess its annual report and said that 50 percent of the net traffic in the U.S. is uh, those two. And they each represent you know, low single digits of total television viewing. Now here comes a very large amount of viewing, potentially, by moving over just small percentages of television viewing. Uh, is, are the technology vendors, is the internet uh, ready for that? No. <laughs> I wish Akamai was here to talk about some of this. Is anybody from Akamai here? Shoot. No, the answer is no. The infrastructure is not there. We don't have the capacity, period. Certainly not for multiple televisions or devices in the home. The first device may be the second device probably stutters, and the third device they're already running into issues, and people will not tolerate those kind of interruptions on the big screen. On computers, on iPads, people accept some of these interruptions or buffering, but I think uh, as more and more content and 4K starts to roll out in a year from now, it's going to be another bigger challenge to uh, take advantage of all the bandwidth, although some of the new compression schemes that are underway will limit that to require only double what we have today instead of four times the bandwidth, but it'll still create a problem that we haven't solved yet. All right. Um, now, uh, changing gears a bit from technology over to business, uh, has, has the success so far of OTT in general and Netflix, uh, has it changed the nature of the content business and, and how deals get done? Uh, you know, Netflix is, I believe, spending well over $2 billion a year on content. Uh, have we seen changes in the dynamics of, of that business because of Netflix and other entrants in, in the OTT space? I think one of the biggest influences is it makes it harder for other OTT players to enter the market Intel tried to enter with their own over-the-top service, and most of us believe that the cost of rights is too expensive. As an MVPD, we have access to most of the programs and on-demand rights. The only area where we're competing with Netflix directly is past seasons of shows and things like that, or the shows that they develop themselves. But everything else, they're really hurting their direct competitors rather than the MSOs, and I think they could see themselves as a model for a future HBO more than they see themselves as a replacement for DirecTV or Comcast at this point. I was going to say, I mean, Netflix got a huge boost from the Stars deal several years ago, um, which was a, a, a very, very cheap, in hindsight, uh, over the top rights deal for some really, really good content. And it allowed them to very quickly expand their user base um, and get to a level where they, they actually could start paying for content. And then when that deal came up, they actually, I mean, I don't know the logistics uh, and, and what happened exactly, but um, they parted. Uh, uh, but by that time, Netflix was, was very, very well established in the streaming space. And, and Netflix has also gotten to the point where, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, Netflix was looking for partners for their streaming service and, uh, you know, for devices um, and, and different types of appliances, whether it's Blu-ray players, TVs, street, uh, dedicated devices, tablets, smartphones, et cetera. And now that's obviously changed. Now Netflix is the 800-pound gorilla that uh, everyone wants to be, you know, to have on their devices and, and they can pick and choose. So uh, there were some things that happened, um, as you point out, many, many years ago in the in kind of infancy of this that uh, really worked out well for them. That makes it very, very hard 
now um, that were you know that, that rights are, are are what they are for someone else to come into in, into the market. And as Campbell pointed out with Amazon, I think that you're right. I think you look at it from a long long term perspective. Um, they are clearly a very very large company with with uh, a lot of resources, um, and I think that they're they're very slowly chipping away. But it's it's not something that can be done overnight. I think in the content industry, they're definitely, if you're producing your own shows, you definitely want to take your shows to the Netflixes and the Amazons. It's easier to sell to them, sell them the whole season up front. I think if you're Viacom or Disney, you've got to think, are you going to cannibalize your subscription service by selling some shows at a reduced price or at a price to Netflix? And you saw that happen with Viacom and Disney this year. They kind of pulled some content out, put some other content out there. So they're trying to figure out what makes the most sense from a business side. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure how disruptive it was to the whole, to the whole industry besides you know adding another cable channel you know there, there's there's a, a number of big content uh, you know distributors cable channels and now there's a there's Netflix as well maybe Amazon there's a there's a finite number that can afford to play but uh, beyond that I'm not sure well there was is one one thing that uh, I, I do recall uh, this was uh, uh, CBS CEO Les Moonves, who uh, CBS owns half of the CW, and Netflix did a deal, I think about a year and a half ago, with the CW uh, for its serialized dramas. You know, they, they do serialized dramas aimed at young women, but serialized dramas do very badly in syndication because uh, if you drop in the middle of one, you're lost, and it's, it's very hard to watch something that you have to watch in order in syndication. But uh, this leads to another question of mine. Netflix, uh, you know, we hear a lot about big data. Uh, and so you see, uh, you hear about uh, retailers like Walmart that for years and years have been harvesting every bit of data that they have about uh, uh, purchases. And they use it to inform uh, how they do sales, how they do purchasing. Uh, big data really hasn't been present in the television business. There's Nielsen, but that's a sample-based uh, uh, data collection activity that's, that's, that's used for uh, uh, currency within the business. It's not this notion of, of recording everything. But Netflix has been recording every bit of data, anonymized, and they use it to go out and do deals with the CW because they know that serialized dramas do much better for them than they do in syndication. Uh, what's this, it, is this notion of big data something that, uh, the rest of the TV industry is concerned about, or are they trying to learn the lessons that uh, that Netflix seems to be learning? Although Netflix is very guarded about talking about what they're doing with all this data, is this wh what are the implications for the television business to be in a business where they can collect data about everything that goes on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're struggling to adapt. Uh, certainly, the big broadcasters are. Um, you know, companies that are doing it right are companies like Google, where they are harvesting massive amounts of data. And, and Amazon, which we talked about earlier, is doing it right. I think they, if they can use that data to make better recommendations, better personalization, et cetera. But um, the big broadcasters, the big American broadcasters, are struggling with, uh, they have access to the information and they know what viewers are watching. But I'm not sure if they know how to make the most of it. I think the challenge, again, I know internally is today our web operation isn't necessarily completely integrated with our TV broadcast, so we may know what people are doing on this platform or the other. That's all changing. I know other competitors are spending a lot of money to unify all those systems in the back end, but the fact that Netflix doesn't really release uh, viewing data, forget the taste, it's hard to know how much of their big data really influ influence their shows versus just having a sense of you know, what their people are doing. But uh, we're all looking at big data, and we'll all take advantage of it as time goes forward. It just means more people are deciding which shows get made instead of a studio boss and a few executives at NBC deciding to greenlight Seinfeld. You'll get 1,000 people on Amazon voting what shows they would watch, and that's what's driving the industry on some level. Yeah, I, I think that the qualm and the IP environments are really siloed. And it's not clear what's happening in one versus the other, and they can't tie those two together. It's one problem that, that Comcast is trying to solve right now with X1 and X2. Um, but really having just qualm, just completely different environments, is a challenge in terms of tying together user behaviors. So this, this is sort of a legacy of just broadcast infrastructure. All right, so we're going to have an uh, opportunity for questions in a moment. Uh, let me just toss out uh, 
uh, sort of a, a final wrap-up uh, question for the, the panel. And this is uh, suggested by one of the panel members, uh, one uh, that might or might not have a mustache. Uh, so, uh, Movember? This Movember. Is Movember. It's a good Movember mustache. It's a cancer research. Not all Movember mustaches are that good. So uh, that's a good one, though. Uh, so uh, certainly we're going to have uh, some companies that are going to be highly, let's say, advantaged uh, by this move to, uh, to more watching of uh, television and movie content uh, in over the top. Uh, there are going to be some co country, uh, companies that, uh, well, we could either use the word challenged or losers. I'll use challenged because it's nicer. Uh, so this will be the wrap-up company, uh, a wrap-up question. Uh, that we'll do after uh, we uh, we have the questions, but so you have some time to think about it. Uh, so uh, let's have some questions, and then we'll go to the the, the wrap up question for the panel. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience? And if you do have a question, uh, is there a microphone for the audience? Um, no. Okay. So I'll I'll repeat it. Uh, so uh, anyone have some questions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so I've been in this space for about five years, and when everyone first started to crying, the trend of cord cutting, it also happened to coincide with the exact time frame when the ranks when the banks broke the entire financial system. And um, being in the space, being, uh, I, I would say, a cord cutter, I said before, a doctor, I see some of these platforms as being things that you just add to give you more choice and flexibility. It's not as re replacing something, it's just giving you more stuff to look at because there's no, no video store. So let me repeat that for the, the, the sake of the, uh, the video cameras. So uh, the question was, uh, because the, the, the rise of OTT and, and the introduction of Netflix as a streaming service uh, more or less be, uh, corresponded uh, with uh, a big economic downturn, how much of what was going on was, was due to the downturn, and how much of, of what's going on is uh, you know, due to just the, 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 the availability of the platforms, and are we seeing evidence now as the economy is improving of, of one trend or another? Well, it's more of a business question. There's no doubt that we've been hurt by the lack of new home formation, the lack of new home sales, because that was a big part of our business. Every June, all the college kids would disconnect and reconnect in the fall. People would be moving, less people moving out of homes. But the, the fact that we gained subscribers last quarter the analysts at least uh, attribute a good portion of that to some of the fighting with Time Warner Cable and the other networks. But I think over the next couple of quarters, we'll see how much of that is really economic growth lifting the whole boat, or how much of it is just switching between the different providers. Uh, one of the things we do is track the, the metrics we can find out in the public, as well as doing consumer research. And I think if you take a long-term look, uh, you go back to 2001, you know, when we had uh, you know, another downturn, I, it, not as deep as, as this one. Uh, annually, the, uh, the multi-service operators were adding 5% a year regularly. One of the, the issues is that we now have 90% penetration into TV households of the, of the operators. And in any market, getting those last few percent is very difficult. So uh, I would say we've gone flat. I, it's you would think the trends would, would indicate that maybe we'd start seeing some cord cutting. We'll see. Ask me in five years, and I'll, <laughs> I'll have a much more definitive answer. Uh, any other questions? I don't think that'll happen unless when ESPN goes all across. 
a month for ESPN because if they go a la carte, that's what they'll have to charge to be able to justify that cost. Meaning, how much would you say? I say ESPN alone it will cost the consumer somewhere between twenty and thirty dollars a month, and that's when they'll realize the value of their package today. Their bundle will look cheap compared to the a la carte prices. Yeah, and, and the question, which I, I think I should repeat, because it's not coming up on the video, is, um, will what was the question? The question is, will ESPN going a la carte change the dynamics of, of court cutting? Yeah. Well, well I mean, there, there is live sports available a la carte. You know, you can sign up for an MLB subscription on Roku or any other platform to watch it. You can uh, uh, get NBA League Pass. You can, you know, these are all basically services for the um, displaced fan, right? The out of market fan. Uh, so if you live in, you know, if you live here and you want to watch Dodger games, that's not going to work. But if you live here and you're a big Red Sox fan, you can sign up for MLB. And these are all services that actually, you know, pay once, a hundred and some odd dollars a year. Watch it on your tablet, watch it on your smartphone, watch it on your TV, through various uh, streaming devices. Um, I mean, s sports in general, uh, you know, you have authenticated app apps as well, uh, whether it be on Apple TV or on Roku. You have the Watch ESPN app and. Uh, the Xbox One's coming out with a with a, a tighter integration in the NFL. Um, uh, you know when they launch, basically, I guess later this week or something like that. So I, I think that sports is is continue to be a driver, and and there are a ton of different services out there for various fans. But uh, you need to, you know if you're a fan and you live in your local market, the choices get a lot smaller. And you know I like to say that's where we would we would come in as a very viable solution for the local market fan who wants to watch their local team while they're either in and around their house or away from their house as well. Do you want to be watching a big game on your big TV and all of a sudden it starts buffering and you miss the big play or it, you, know, you miss something? I don't think the quality is going to be there in the immediate future. Unless the uh, programmer is using Adobe Prime Time. I disagree. Thank you. Yeah, I disagree. Very good. That, that quality thing, you just playing that quality card. The quality is phenomenal, especially inside the home. It's up to 1080p quality on all the, all the support devices. And outside, and outside the home, the, yes, that's true. We are better. We, are, we make your cable subscription better, right? We don't replace it. We are a, we are a more value to it. But I think that outside the home, those, those challenges are, you know, th those existed several years ago. Those challenges, whether it be 4G LTE, whether it be even lower grade 3G, um, and other Wi-Fi services, um, uh, upstream bandwidth in the home is actually much, much greater now than it was in the past. Um, all those different things, I think, that were challenges are, are definitely getting resolved. Yeah. So we, we could uh, actually, I think, have a, a three-day conference about bundling and a la carte. Um, I'll drop a couple more metrics in. Uh, the, the Disney financials, you go look at them, if I'm remembering correctly. 30% of the free cash flow for the entire Disney Corporation is coming from ESPN. And if you go look at their 10K, it'll tell you what it is. But ESPN is vital to the, the financials of Disney. And I believe even though when, uh, say, Comcast and Disney re-up on a, on a carriage agreement, which they did, I guess, in the last 12 months, they never tell any of the details except the, uh, you know, how many properties are included. But the, the, the rumors I've been hearing is that these are very, they're negotiating very long-term deals because they, yeah, they, they want runway to figure out what to do as we keep moving towards an a la carte on-demand world. Now, that sounds like analysts speak. You know what? There's still going to be channel bundles 15 years from now. But, but the trend definitely is towards moving towards on-demand and a la carte. Uh, and you know, how, how does ESPN transist to that you know, world of the future? I think is a big question. Um, so One of the questions is, will Netflix and Amazon and Hulu show up as channels on your TV in two to five years? That's, that's true. Or, or yeah. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get back to the, uh, the wrap-up question. This is sort of a fast one. I think we're looking not so much for names of companies, unless you want to go there. Uh, uh, in terms of who, who gets advantage the most by, by leveraging uh, over-the-top TV? And, and who gets threatened the most by this move? I, I think the, uh, the the clear winner is the broadband uh, service provider. You know, every one of these bits that flows uh, over, whether your uh, you know, Time Warner cable and your video subscribers drop because of cord cutting, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, high margin 
benefit on the broadband side. So I think broadband side of the businesses uh, win. And losers, I think, really are uh, uh, the, the older demographic consumers who right now all these things are too complicated and so they don't get to take advantage of some of the services because you know they're not going to hook together a whole bunch of different devices uh, and try to figure it out. It needs to be more simple. Yeah, I, I think the winners, um, just in the broadest sense, are viewers generally, um, consumers who have access to more content. I think that once the UI issues are figured out, and once the experience gets better, once the um, the, the guide on your set top box looks good and understands you, I think people, you, everybody in this room as uh, as a consumer wins. Um, I think that the losers are companies that don't pay any regard to the viewing experience, um, specifically companies that tie the video experience to a specific place, like what goes on in your hotel room. I think the company that provides that service is a loser. That company is going to be displaced, because when I come to the Hyatt, when I go anywhere, when I travel for work or pleasure, I want to bring DirecTV with me. I'm already paying them X 60 bucks a month, 80 bucks a month. Why can't I watch that in my hotel room? Why should I have to pay 15 bucks to watch a movie with this crappy UI? That's an awful experience, and I think consumers know that. So that's who I think is the loser. It isn't didn't, isn't LodgeNet? Isn't aren't they going? I away thought we were told yeah. not. To oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, specify. Uh, naming I, names. I will say. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I I will say. Um, I say content owners are, are actually, you know, the, the programmers are, are, are really big winners. You have, uh, as David said, um, you have all these infinite choices now of where to shop your content uh, and, and, and put it in front of uh, millions and millions of viewers. And, and the traditional kind of paradigm of, of the pilot, you know, shooting the pilot and then uh, doing the episodes and, and, and investing all this money, that's changing quite a bit. And all of a sudden now with Netflix, you've got... 28 million or whatever that number is, eyeballs of potential viewers uh, for your content that you didn't have before. And you have a lot of different other places to monetize it. So I think that they're going to benefit tremendously. And I do agree that broadband providers will benefit as well. And, and it, it comes in a lot of different forms, obviously. But, but the traditional broadband service providers will, will continue to benefit because they own the pipes. I would add the C industry to that, especially the companies selling tablets and phones who continue to the big companies who continue to make money take market share from the smaller ones. I disagree with the older consumer being disadvantaged. I think they're just not interested in it. It's actually a better experience on some of these devices than it is on the television today. And it's our ball game to lose to make that experience come back to the television so it's just as easy to use that on the TV. I think like voice search is something that an older consumer would embrace if they had the option, but they're just not comfortable doing that. But once they do, it'll be a better experience for them than trying to navigate the program guide on the television. There's something to be said about the, the very easy navigation of a, an Apple TV-like device with five buttons or a Roku uh, using the TV screen's um, uh, uh, area to the real estate to show much more of a visual representation of content. Um, the Netflix, the new Netflix UI is a, a clear example of that. The, uh, my children navigate the Netflix uh, app on the iPad by pictures. You know, there's SpongeBob, there's you know, the Ninja Turtles, there's uh, whoever else. And, that, and that's, how they, that's how they find things. And I think that's, that's, that's going to get better and better. So, so the, the two-year-olds can navigate, I agree. But how about the 62 or 72-year-olds? They, they, their eyes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, panel, for uh, contributing and, and, and being part of the panel. And thank you, audience members, for uh, attending. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you had too. All right, thanks.